بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وضرب لهم مثلا أصحاب القرية إذ جاءها المرسلون إذ أرسلنا إليهم اثنين فكذبوهما فعززنا بثالث فعززنا بثالث فقالوا إنا إليكم مرسلون قالوا ما أنتم إلا بشر مثلنا وما أنزل الرحمن من شيء وما أنزل الرحمن من شيء إن أنتم إلا تكذبون صدق الله العظيم أما بعد respected brothers and sisters dearest elders beloved youth السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته With many of the Anbiya alayhim salam these great prophets and messengers that Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala has sent to this world throughout the history of mankind. Many of these great Anbiya, their names have been mentioned in the quran Karim, their exact description, who they were, where they lived, what were their qualities. And subhanallah, this becomes a great asset for every human being that comes in this world till the day of judgment, that we have someone to look at as a role model. We have someone that we can see how they walked, how they lived, how they carried themselves in this world, which is a source of guidance and hidayah for all of the human beings that will come into this world all the way till the day of judgment. Brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, we have covered almost all of the 25 Anbiya that are mentioned in the quran Karim. In certain places of the Qur'an, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala makes mention of what is known as the secret prophets. These secret hidden anbiya. Their names are not mentioned, but we understand from the context of the quran Karim that these people were prophets. So in Surah Yasin, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala makes mention of the Ashabul Qariya. And it's amazing to see the eloquence of the Qur'an. There's like a secret why these people are kept hidden. These people are kept secret. What is this Qariya? What is this town, this city? Allah doesn't clarify and mention the details. Who, who were these people of this town? What was the name of the town? What century did they live in? Allah doesn't mention those things. The prophets that came to them, what were their names? Who were they? Allah doesn't mention that either. Allah just mentions the story. What happened with them? What did they do? What was the response when the prophets came to this town and called the people to Allah? How did they respond and what was their reply? And what was the consequence of that? Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala sometimes keeps it vague so that we can understand the point and the moral to the lesson that we can take back from it. And subhanallah, these, the people of this city, they were not blessed with only one prophet. They were not blessed with two prophets. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala sent three messengers to this one city for their guidance. Allahu Akbar. So I'm going to read the verses of the quran Karim in Surah Yasin where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these people. So in Surah Yasin, verse number 13, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا أَصْحَابَ الْقَرِيَةِ And cite to them the example of the people of the town. إِذْ جَاءَهَا الْمُرْسَلُونَ When the prophets and the messengers, they came to it. When we sent them the two messengers, so first Allah sent two prophets to these people, to this entire town, Two prophets supporting one another, 
they came to call these people to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. When the two messengers were sent, what happened? They rejected them both. فَكَذَّبُوهُمَا They said, what you're coming with, this is not true. We don't know what your people are preaching, if this is the truth or falsehood. We don't want to hear your message. They basically denied them. Both prophets that came, they were denied. So look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does after this. فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثٍ So we supported them, we supported these two messengers with a third one. فَقَالُوا إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ All three of these messengers, they told the people of the town, we are messengers that have been sent to you. So brothers and sisters, a few points that we can take from this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wishes the welfare of mankind. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala wants the goodness of mankind to follow hidayah, to follow guidance. If Allah wanted, He could have sent one. One messenger, one prophet. You choose not to listen, you are deserving of punishment. Allah didn't just send one, He sent two. Right? Mutually they're supporting one another. Mutually they're supporting each other's mission. Still these people did not believe. That is enough again. One prophet came, two prophet came. Your case is over with. You disbelieved. The proof was right in front of you. You still chose not to follow. But no, Allah sent the third prophet as well. As a support, benefit these people. Give them the message. Let them hear the truth. Right? And this is... What we learn from this, brothers and sisters, is that sometimes in our lives, Allah sends us signs. Yes, it may not be a messenger, it may not be a prophet that's coming each time, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many times, He shows us signs. We need to read between the lines and understand the signs that Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala sends us. Right? And these signs, it's individual for every human being. Allah shows you certain things. And on an individual level, on an individual capacity, when Allah shows you things, you understand deep within your heart the reality and the truthfulness of Islam and how this deen, it's divine. We all know many cases in our lives, we made dua for something, right? After seeking all of the resources that we have from this world, we went to the doctor, for example. We signed papers, for example. We went to so many different people giving our resumes, for example. We did everything that we could from this world. We left no stone unturned. And all the doors were closed upon us. And then we turned to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. We performed two rakats. We cried our hearts in Salatul Tahajjud. And suddenly, you know, sometimes maybe one year, two years, three years, we were trying to pursue something which we failed each and every time. Three years, four years. But one night of crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the very next day, the doors were opened for us. How many cases of this we have heard from community members. I've heard personally from so many people and many of us, we've experienced ourselves. Right? Where you made dua for something, and exactly as you wanted, Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala answered it for you. You saw the truthfulness of your call to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. He gave you this sign. When you see a sign of Allah, that now comes with a responsibility. What is that responsibility? Turn to your deen. Turn to Allah. Be serious about your Islam. Don't take this deen for granted. Don't take Islam lightly. Take it seriously. Many times people have seen when we've indulged in certain sins, when we've indulged in certain things that Islam does not like, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with. Sometimes what happens? Metaphorically, Allah gives you a tap on the hand. Right? Something difficult happens in your life. Some calamity strikes in your life. And automatically in your heart, what comes to your mind? This might be because I did that thing. Allah is testing me now. Allah is showing me the consequences of what I have done. Right? So now a, a person who has logic, a person who's level-headed, you're not going to play with fire. You're not going to play and juggle with coals. Maybe it didn't burn me this time, maybe I can get away with it again. Maybe the third time I'll... No. If you got burned once, what happens? You come to your senses. This is something that's not good for me. I don't want to juggle coals. This is something that has 
pro- proven to be detrimental. I'm not going to engage in this again. Allah gives signs, 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 signs. It's up to us to open our eyes. Right? So these same people, Allah sent them two messengers. Two messengers was not enough. Allah sent them a third messenger. Still, what happened? Their eyes and their hearts were still blind. They weren't willing to listen. They weren't willing to cooperate with these great messengers and prophets of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. So don't wait for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, to show you this grand sign. I've mentioned this many times before. Sometimes this is what we wait for. Ya Allah, show me a sign. Right? Ya Allah, show me a sign that what I'm doing is wrong. Ya Allah, show me a sign that this is what I need to do. Don't wait for all of these signs because sometimes when the sign comes, the sign will be too overburdening for you to handle. The sign might be so heavy for you. And now if you turn a blind eye to that sign, you will be held more, more so you'll be held accountable because Allah showed you and still you turned your back to it. Does that make sense? It's important. When Allah shows you things, take it very, very seriously. Do not take it lighthearted. Do not take it lightly. So brothers and sisters, these, the people of this town, the three messengers that came, they denied all of them. And the Mufassirin make mention that perhaps part of the reason why the people of this town disbelieved and they couldn't bring their hearts to terms with accepting the message of these prophets was because these people, they lived in absolute comfort and luxury. So the town that they were living in, it was a town that was lush. It was a town that was progressing. It was a town that everything that they needed, this town had. And we know, especially in the olden ages, right? Life was very, very difficult. For some towns, you had issues with water. For some areas, from some cities, you had issues with certain crops, with vegetation. You had to travel far and wide to get the things that you need. And that level of sacrifice, commitment, discipline, of having to work hard for what you want, sometimes it brought people that sacrifice, that difficulty, it brought people to terms. But this town, absolutely nothing. Everything that they needed, everything that they wanted, they had it at their fingertips. This town had a huge wall that was encircling the entire city so they were well protected they didn't have any fear and whatever they needed within the wall of this town everything that they wanted and needed they had it at their disposal so in comparison to the luxury the safety and the progress of this town you compare it with everyone in their surroundings these people were very well off they were very much in luxury in happiness and in contentment So brothers and sisters, we all understand when a person is content, when a person has what they need, when a person feels that luxury, I have what I need, my life is going exactly where it needs to go, we become complacent, you become comfortable, and you don't like any bit of change to come into your life. Does this sound like anyone? Brothers and sisters, I have to say, it sounds like me. May Allah forgive me, may Allah open my eyes. In this country, we become comfortable, we become lax, we become complacent. Everything that you have, it's at your disposal. Whatever you need, these people, the vegetation that they needed, at least they had to plant it, right? They want corn, mashallah, they have the corn, but they still have to plant it, they have to water it, they have to irrigate it, they have to harvest it. Today, mashallah, you want a big double cheeseburger, just go on your phone, MashaAllah, DoorDash, the guy's going to come to your front door and you're going to have your double cheeseburger right there. You want fries? MashaAllah. You go on your app, you will choose and select normal fries. What's the other kind of fries? I forgot what they're called. Cheesy fries, fries, loaded fries. That's not the right one I was looking for though. Curly Curly fries, yes. You'll make all your choices, choose whatever you want, no effort at all, and MashaAllah, it's there at your doorstep. Right? Who wants that to change? Nobody wants that to change. You want, you're comfortable where you are. So these people, they were comfortable where they are. They said these prophets are going to come. They're going to change the way that we worship. They're going to change the way that we bow and prostrate to our idols. 
They're going to change the way that we do business. They're going to change the way that we have you know, our relationships with our family members and our spouses and our children. We're afraid when this change comes into our lives. Are we going to miss out and lose out on this comfortable life that we have? We're not sure. Maybe these people will change that. We're a little bit skeptical. We're a little bit suspicious. We're not willing to sacrifice the comfort that we're in. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? So what happens? The people who are used to discomfort, the people who are used to giving up their luxuries, the people that they're willing to be put in a situation that they're not familiar with, this type of heart, this type of lifestyle is open to changes. It's open to betterment. It's open to sacrifices. Right? So, how can we be from amongst those people? Don't be subjected to the comforts of your life. Sometimes be willing to tough it out a little. Sometimes be willing to have a little bit of difficulty in life. Right? And this is why we see majority of the people that followed the prophets, they were people that were rough, people that were tough, people that were willing to go through the sacrifice, the difference in the previous lifestyle with the new lifestyle. So sometimes tough it out, right? The, and the, the, when I say tough it out, the tough it out that we have to do is nothing compared to what the people of the past had to do. مَسَّتْهُمُ الْبَأْسَى وَالضَّرَّى Difficulties, calamities afflicted them. وَزُلْزِلُوا They were shaken. Right? Zulzilu means like an earthquake. That's how they were shaken. حَتَّى يَقُولَ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهِ Right? They would ask, when is the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to come? They would be shaken. وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرُ In some cases, the hearts and the souls would reach their throats. That's the level of fear, anxiety, the difficulties of the situations that they were in. Right? Literally, life and death, they're seeing it right in front of them. Right? So our difficulties that we have to go through, brothers and sisters, right? Sometimes, and I'll tell you what I do personally. It's like, this is something, when I look back at it, I laugh at it. And I assume the people of the past, if they were to look at us and say, this is this guy's difficulty, what difficulty is this? Simple things, brothers and sisters. You see, it's a very, very cold day. Go for salah outside on that day. When you're making wudu, right? Make wudu in the cold sometimes, no problem, right? Sometimes it's cold, it's winter, you fill up the uh, bucket of water for istinja or you're making wudu. Sometimes tell yourself, man, today I'm not going to waste the water. I'm going to put it on, it takes five minutes, you're, the water is gushing, 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 and then it gets warm. It's okay, I'm not going to waste the water. I'm going to use the cold water today, right? Sometimes, Accustom yourself so that when the real time comes that you have to sacrifice, you're okay with it, right? It's a difficult day. The, you know, the wife didn't make your five-star biryani tonight and nihadi and qabli palau, right? So now when you go home, instead of throwing a fit and causing ruckus and chaos and then you have to spend all your money to go and eat out, it's okay. Eat the dal that she cooked. Eat the beans that she prepared, Right? Your favorite juice is not there. Your favorite soda is not there. Alhamdulillah, I have clean and pure water that I can drink. Right? Accustom ourselves to this, inshaAllah. This will make us disciplined. This will make us strong. Right? The people of this town, what happened to them? They wanted luxury, luxury, luxury. They did not want any change. They could not tolerate any difference in the easy, accommodating, happy lifestyle that they had. Right? So now we see... This particular town that they were living in, the name is actually not mentioned in the Qur'an Kareem. And in the classical narrations and scholarship, there is some difference of opinion what town this actually was. So, according to many people, this town was called Antakiya, which is a place in Syria where they had you know, all of these luxuries and some people say, no, it was not this town, it was somewhere else. Wallahu a'lam, where this exact place was. But the point is, the Qur'an does not mention that. Allah hides that information so that we can focus 
on the lesson, what we learn, right? So once again, you can understand the situation, how these people were luxurious, comfortable, at ease. They didn't want any change, right? So we understand that in life, sometimes when you have all of these goods, you have all of this comfort, it distracts you from what actually needs to be done with your spiritual life, right? And an easy example of this, you take a child, right? Take a child, give them a, a, a phone or give them an iPad, right? When it's lunchtime or dinner time, they're hungry, they haven't eaten anything, the diaper needs to be changed. If you give them that phone, you give them that iPad, they will look down, they will keep playing. They will keep watching things. They will keep going from one game to another game, to another video, to another video. And guess what? They'll forget that they're hungry. They're they'll forget that they didn't have breakfast. They didn't have lunch. They're supposed to eat their dinner. They won't even remember. They won't eat. Right? They will forget their needs and necessities because they're distracted by what? The comfort and the happiness of that phone which is in front of them. So like this, brothers and sisters, even as adults, Sometimes, what blocks us from realities, what blocks us from our true needs and necessities, our spiritual lives, our deen, what blocks us from that? All of the comforts, the entertainment, all of the good things that are in front of us, sometimes it blocks us from actually seeing the true needs and responsibilities that we have towards our deen. So, these people... They rejected the third prophet that came. And what did they say? وَمَا أَنزَلَ الرَّحْمَانُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ قَالُوا مَا أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُنَا وَمَا أَنزَلَ الرَّحْمَانُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا تَكْذِبُونَ Look at the way that they spoke to the messengers. The first thing they said, مَا أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُنَا You're nothing but humans just like me. Just like us. You're human, we're human. So why is what you say given preference and precedence over what we say. We're humans, we have our opinion. You're a human, you have your opinion. So why should we believe in you? How are you a, a, a true prophet? You're a human, why should we believe you? Second thing they said, مَا أَنزَلَ الرَّحْمَانُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ The Ar-Rahman, the most merciful, يعني they're talking about Allah. He has not revealed anything. نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ He has not revealed anything, he has not sent anyone. You, and lastly, in antum illa takribun, you people are just lying. You're just telling lies. So, when you hear the response of these people, you can understand these are not people that are trying to understand. These are not people that are trying to have a logical conversation. These are not people that are trying to use their reason. Hey, let's listen to what you have to say. No, they're outright being disrespectful. And this is very important for us to understand as people who, who spread Islam, who spread the deen. Right? Because sometimes what happens, you might hear something that makes you upset. You're trying to call someone towards Islam, you might hear someone with an angry tone towards you. But the true way of the prophets and messengers, you hear an angry tone from someone, you don't start yelling at them. You don't start bad-mouthing them. You don't start behaving aggressively with them. No, you listen to what they have to say and you reply with dignity. And this is what we will see in the next few verses. So, right? You don't believe we're prophets and messengers? You think we're humans just like you? What did they say? They said, our Lord knows that indeed we are prophets that have been sent to you. Look at that. Wisdom, composure, you don't believe it, that's on you. Our Lord knows that we've been sent to you. Allah knows that we've been sent to you. You can deny all you want. You can fight with us all you want. My Lord and our Lord, Allah knows that we are truly messengers. وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ There is nothing upon us except giving you a clear message. That's our job, is to deliver the message to you. Whether you believe or you disbelieve, that's upon you. Right? My job is just to deliver. I'm the delivery man. Right? I deliver the message. Accepting it or rejecting it, that's upon you. My job is not to make you believe. My job is to just give you the message. So, this was the message that was delivered to them. Now, 
how did they reply after the prophets you know they behaved harshly the prophets replied with mercy and compassion now you would expect okay these people are you know coming down to our level let's talk to them nicely as well what did they say what was the next thing that they said they said we take you as a bad omen for us if you do not desist and stop we will certainly stone you and you will be subjected to a painful punishment from us so now they started threatening them either you stop your preaching either you stop giving this message or we're gonna stone you we're gonna beat you up we're gonna kick you out we're gonna inflict pain on you if you don't stop teaching and preaching this message that you're giving right so the prophets are you know preaching goodness calm with uh, composure and these people they're replying with what anger threats and hostility so the prophets replied your bad omen is with yourselves do you take it as a bad omen that you're given good counsel rather you are people who have crossed all limits right so this is what they said whatever bad things happen they would blame the prophets you're a ba you're bad luck for us you're a bad omen for us right so because of your presence you know bad things will happen to us and when these prophets started delivering their message around that time a famine struck they started disbelieving in the prophets they were subjected to a famine so when the famine came the famine was actually because of their disbelief the famine was there because of their rejection but they attributed the famine to what and ever since these prophets came out giving their message now there's famine because of these people's presence here now we're seeing difficulties man the pe presence of these people is causing us evil it's because of them the prophets replied calmly whatever uh, bad omen that you have that you feel is present it's because of your own deeds it's not because of us right so they replied in a very dignified way Now, brothers and sisters, at this point, the prophets delivered their message, the people were not accepting. They started plotting, they started planning that if these messengers don't stop delivering their message, we're going to assassinate them. We're going to take their lives, we're going to get rid of them ourselves. They started plotting, they started planning to assassinate the messengers. So through the grapevines, some of the people, they started to hear about this. They understood that there's a group of people that are planning this. From amongst the people that heard about this plot, there was a believer. There was a believer who followed these three messengers. His whole life, he was living in the outskirts of the city. He was living towards the gates and the entrance of the city, living his own life. Not a lot of people knew about him. But he was a man that eventually became a believer from the first of the believers of this town. So it is mentioned that he lived near the gates. So when the prophets entered the gates of the city, he was from amongst the first people that they addressed. They found this man was worshipping idols. And he was a person that had leprosy. He was a leper. He had skin disease. So the prophets came to him and they said, you're worshipping these idols. Why don't you worship the Lord of the worlds? Why don't you worship the creator of everything? Allah created you, but you're worshipping the idols? How does that make sense? Worship the one that created you. So he said, okay, let me ask you something. Can the creator of the heavens and the earth cure the skin disease that I have? Because I've been praying 70 years to these idols and I've been praying to them and asking of them to cure the sickness of mine. But my sickness has not been cured. Can your Lord cure the sickness? So the prophets told him, of course, you accept Islam, we will make dua for you, you will make dua, and you will see that Allah will give you cure. Because these idols of yours, لا ينفعونكم ولا يضرون. These idols can't benefit you, these idols cannot harm you, they can't do anything for you. Right? Just like, brothers and sisters, you know, the ulama make mention, for the people of the past, it was the idols. 
that they would worship. They would say, this will bring us goodness, this will do good for us, this will repel calamities for us. And in our world, in our context, in the modern age, yeah, we don't worship idols. But discreetly and metaphorically, the different things that we look for in life that will repel our calamities, that will bring us happiness, that will bring us ease and contentment, those have become like metaphorical idols in our lives. Some people, they will turn to drugs and alcohol. That's like their metaphorical idols. This is what will bring ease for us. This is what will bring us comfort. For some people, illicit relationships, right? Be with other, you know, be with the opposite gender, be with different haram relationships, this will bring us ease. Chat with people online, this will bring us the contentment we're looking for. It's not an idol, but it's a metaphorical idol. The people of the past, they would worship the idols for contentment. We have various forms of idols besides Allah that we're taking to look for com comfort and ease and happiness in life. True happiness and ease, it will only come from Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala through submission to Him. So these people, when the prophets came to this particular person, they said, stop worshipping the idols, worship Allah. Wholeheartedly from the depths of his heart, he accepted Islam and he became a Muslim. And Allahu Akbar, when he became a Muslim, he devoted himself. The prophets went on to teach the rest of the people. He remained in his household, worshipping Allah as a Muslim. He came to know of this plot and this plan that the people are trying to assassinate the prophets. What was his response? What did he do when he heard the people are trying to assassinate the prophets? Before we get to that point of what he did, just another important point to cover, the wording that these people used, they said, مَا أَنزَلَ الرَّحْمَنُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ The Ar-Rahman has not revealed anything. He has not sent anything. How would these people know what is Ar-Rahman? Right? Ar-Rahman is a quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a name of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. So at first instance, when they're talking about deen, they're talking about who is to be worshipped, they're talking about the Almighty, and then suddenly these people say, Ar-Rahman has not revealed anything. How did they know what is Ar-Rahman? So many of the ulama, many of the mufassireen, they mention that these people, their ancestors were actually believers. Their ancestors, their forefathers were Muslims. They knew that there were certain things about Islam. They knew certain aspects of religion, of deen, of Islam. There's a God, He is Ar-Rahman, He is Ar-Rahim. The forefathers practiced these things. But slowly, slowly what happened? Islam started to deteriorate within their households. One by one, aspects of Islam started to fall out of their lives. And one by one, deviant practices started to come into their lives. Until finally what happened? All of Islam was left out and they fell into idol worship. Brothers and sisters, this aspect, this one note that these people knew Ar-Rahman, this is particularly very worrying for us. Especially living in this country, how deen slowly, slowly, slowly is deterior deteriorating from the lives of the ummah. Wallahi, it's scary. Wallahi, it's concerning. And every Muslim, you should have this concern in your life. That in my lineage, in my household, in my city, in my community, will there be people that were born into Muslim families that will eventually leave Islam. Right now there are studies, brothers and sisters, there are studies right now that say one in four Muslims that were born in a Muslim household, they grow up to leave Islam. One in four, that's 25%. That's alarming. Will this number be in my house? Will this number be part of your house? Will this number be part of people in our communities? It makes us think, brothers and sisters, it worries us. And we have to stand up to this worry. We have to stand up to battle against this worry. Today, we will see 
You can ask any Islamic teacher in the Bay Area. What types of things are your 8-year-olds talking about? What types of conversations are your 9, 10-year-olds talking about? They're talking about LGBT. They're talking about, you know, once upon a time, boyfriend and girlfriend, that worried us. Today, we're worried about boyfriend and boyfriend, girlfriend and, and girlfriend. This is what's on the table today. Why can't I be friends with a person who's gay? These are topics. Kids are asking this. And they're genuinely confused. They're genuinely confused. Why can't I be friends with a girl who likes other girls? She's a good person. She doesn't lie. She doesn't cheat. She doesn't steal. So why can't I be friends with her? What's wrong with that? Right? And slowly, slowly, these opinions, these beliefs, these questions, they marinate in the hearts of these kids till the time comes, na'udhu billah, they grow up and they question their faith. Right? We have to be very, very concerned, brothers and sisters. And the way that we will do this is by preserving Islam, calling towards Islam, protecting our faith. Right? Because when we look at the initial stages of Islam, Every house was a madrasa. Every house was a place of learning and teaching. You look at Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an, how did he become Muslim? He became Muslim by going to madrasa. Listen to this carefully. Umar radiallahu an, how did he become Muslim? He became a Muslim because by mistake, he entered a secret madrasa that was practicing in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. What is the secret madrasa that I'm talking about? Umar radiallahu an, he had a sister that became Muslim. And in their home, they had a teacher that was coming to teach them the verses of the Qur'an Kareem, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala an. When Umar heard that his sister became a Muslima, he rushed to her house. And he said, I'm going to finish off all of these people. When he entered the home, you know what he saw? You know what he heard? You know what the people were busy doing? They were learning and teaching the Qur'an Kareem. His sister was learning the Qur'an. They were reciting Surah Taha. Right? Three people in that household, they were learning and teaching the verses of the Qur'an. At a time where all of their surroundings was anti-Islam anti deen anti-religion, understandings and mentalities to take you away from Islam. What, was, what were the people doing at that time? They were preserving their religion through learning and teaching. Brothers and sisters, every household was a madrasa. Today, if we want to preserve Islam, each household in our community needs to become a madrasa. What does that mean? Do you need to teach, you know, Bukhari and all the... Top, top books of Islam? No. Take a simple book of hadith, read it with your family. Take a simple, you know, have a simple session where 15, 20 minutes, the family sits together and reads Qur'an, the virtues of recitation of the Qur'an. Sit together and read the virtues of salah, the virtues of all these simple things of our Islam. Preservation of deen is in the simple things, brothers and sisters. We become confused today, we think preservation of deen is how? You have to have a grand conference. You have to have expensive food. You have to have expensive chandeliers. You have to have the best equipment and all of these things. That's how Islam is going to be preserved. I'm not saying don't do it. Do it, that's fine. But the true preservation of Islam is in the simple ways, brothers and sisters. The kids coming to the masjid, sitting on the floor, reading their Quran, that's preservation of the deen. Every night you don't miss, you read with the kids stories of the Prophet ﷺ, that's preservation of deen. You're having small talk with your family, you talk about Allah and you talk about Rasul, that's preservation of deen. You don't need all the fancy things to come with it, you don't need all the fancy baggage. Every household in the time of the Prophet ﷺ was a mini madrasa, they were learning and teaching brothers and sisters. Darul Arqam was set up because the Muslims could not practice in open. They could not practice publicly. So Darul Arqam was a special place that was established 
in secrecy. Come to Darul Arkham, you can learn about Islam there. There will be people learning and teaching the deen. So these people, they knew Ar-Rahman. It was like a glimpse of the past for them. Oh, you're teaching this oneness of God? Yeah, we remember something like that. Maybe our grandpa used to teach that. Yeah, we remember. There was something called Ar-Rahman. Yeah, you're the same people. Allahu Akbar. If you look in South America, right? You look in South America today. There was a large population of Muslims that migrated from the Middle East. They migrated to South America. They were Muslims. They were praying Salah. They were reading Qur'an. And if you look today, many of the Jamaats have gone to South, South America. And you know what the local people are telling them? What's your name? My name is Abdullah. And what does the person say? Hey, my grandpa's name was Abdullah. And what is he wearing around his neck? He's wearing a cross. What's your name? My name is Muhammad. Really? I had an uncle named Muhammad. He's wearing a cross. Right? So if you look at South America, these were communities of Muslims that migrated there. But if you look just, you know, two, cent two generations later, one generation later, what happened? They lost all of their religion. They lost their deen, their grandkids. They no longer identify as Muslims. Why? Because this process of learning and teaching was eradicated. They didn't take this process importantly. Right? So for protection of our faith, we must ensure that learning and teaching is something that must continue always. So now the people of the town, what did they do? They were plotting and planning the assassination of these prophets. So look at what took place at this juncture. That great man that accepted Islam, who was practicing his deen in the outskirts of the city, when he found out that the people wanted to assassinate the prophets, he quickly hastened to their defense. He quickly ran from where he was and he said, I'm going to protect these prophets. They taught me Islam. They taught me the worship of my creator. I will protect them and I will try my best to defuse the situation at all costs. The quran Kareem makes mention, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ What did he say? He said, there came a man rushing from the farthest part of the city and he said, O oh my people, follow the messengers and look how much he loves the messengers. He gives their description. Follow those who do not ask you for any reward and they're on the right path. Right? Look at these people. They don't ask you for money. They don't ask you for a reward. They came as travelers. They're teaching you. You can see their lifestyle. They're truthful. They're honest. They're good people. They don't have any personal gain or benefit for why they've come here. They're here just to teach you. Why are you doubting them? Follow them and believe in them. Accept their good counsel. And he continues, What excuse do I have if I do not worship the one who has created me and to whom you will all be returned? Should I take any gods besides him that if Allah, the Ar-Rahman, intends to do harm to me, their intercession cannot help me in the least, nor can they come to my rescue. Why should I worship these idols? If Allah wants harm for me, these idols can't help me. If Allah wants good for me, these idols cannot do any good. It's only Allah that's going to give. So why should I worship them? My worship should only be to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. So if I worship idols after I've realized all of this, right, I'm going to be in clear error. Undoubtedly, I have believed in your Lord, so listen to me. So look, look at what this man did. Essentially, if the people of the town want to assassinate the prophets, anyone who defends them and believes in them, what does that mean? What does that mean? They're also going to be targeted, right? We want these prophets, we want to kill them, we want to stop the message. So anybody who's advocating for them, anyone who's trying to protect them and also believe in them and propagate their message, we're coming after you too. So this man, he put himself in death's way. He put himself between the prophets and their murder and he stopped. He said, look, right? If you're going to kill someone, kill me basically. That's what he did. He basically put his life in front 
to protect the lives of these prophets. Allahu Akbar. And the very next verse, look at what it says. قِيلَ دْخُلِ الْجَنَّةِ Enter the paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the announcement is made to this person. Enter the paradise. What does that mean? So from the story, Allah has been cut out. What, tra what transpired after that? This man stood between the people of the town and the prophets. And the people of the town, they beat him. They stoned him. They assaulted him. All the way until the extent that he became a shaheed, he became a martyr, he was killed in the defense of the prophets. So he lost his life. But subhanallah, we say he lost his life, he actually gained life. Because look at what Allah is telling him. Enter paradise. Enter jannah. You gave your life for protecting these prophets. You gave your life for Islam. Now there's jannah for you. Right? Now I want us to understand, this person, he just lost his life, he just died, right? By the people of this town, they stoned him, they beat him, they behaved very aggressively and violently with him. So now that he's in Jannah, what do you think his mindset is going to be? I'm enjoying, may Allah punish those people. I'm enjoying, they tortured me, may Allah deal with them and, and punish them and torture them. Look at the words that this man says. And in many narrations, this man, his name is mentioned, Habib al-Najjar. Habib, the carpenter. Right? You can imagine, he's just a humble man doing his carpentry in the side of the town. His name was Habib. When he gets the glad tidings of Jannah, after he is martyred, look at what he says. قَالَ يَا لَيْتَ قَوْمِي يَعْلَمُونَ بِمَا غَفَرَ لِي رَبِّي وَجَعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُكْرَمِينَ If only my people could know how my Lord has forgiven me and placed me amongst the honored ones. So basically what he's saying is, I wish my people, the people of this town, I wish they could see how Allah has blessed me, how He has forgiven me, how He has honored me. Because if they were to see this, Perhaps they would accept Islam and they would leave their evil ways. Allahu Akbar. These great people, the prophets and their followers, they never had this animosity. They never had this emotional aspect of revenge. I want to get back from people. They never had this quality. Their quality was of forgiveness. That's why the Prophet ﷺ makes mention in, in uh, a narration that there, was a, there were prophets that as they were giving the messages to their people, they were beaten, they were stoned, they were hit, they were bleeding. And as the blood was trickling down their faces, do you know what they said? Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, forgive my nation because they don't know. Forgive, look at this. They're getting beat. They're trickling with blood. But they're still asking forgiveness for their people. On the incident of Ta'if, what happened to the Prophet ﷺ, where blood had clogged his blessed sandals, alayhi salatu wasalam, the angel came and said, O Prophet of Allah, this mountain and this mountain, Allah has made me in charge of them. Just give me the command, I will make both of these mountains come together, the people of Ta'if will be crushed in between for what they have done to you. The mountains are at, are at your command, O Prophet of Allah. Just give me the command. And the, the, the mountains will crush these people in between. The Prophet ﷺ was not hungry for revenge. He was not a person that was anxious to punish and torment people and to get back at others. He was a person of forgiveness, of tolerance. He wanted people's guidance. That's what he wished for. You know what he said? Right? They bloodied me. They, they hurt me, they tortured me. The blood is gushing from my body. But the Prophet ﷺ told the angel, do not punish them. Do not crush them between the mountains. Because they didn't believe. But maybe from their children and their offspring, there will, people, there will be people that will accept the message and say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. 
and Allahu Akbar. Just as the Prophet ﷺ predicted, a large group of Muslims came from the people of Ta'if. A large group of Muslims and their, and their lineage, many of them, they became Muslims. Today you go to Ta'if, all Muslims are residing in Ta'if. It's all Muslim. So look, the Prophet ﷺ, he had a lot of affection towards people, a lot of compassion towards people, right? This is why all prophets, they were first made to be what? Shepherds. Do you know why? Because when you're a shepherd, you love these little goats, you love these little sheep, you don't want the wolf to eat them. But when you're trying to get the, the, the sheep to come, what does the little annoying sheep do? He runs away. And then you have to get him with the stick, and then you have to send the dog. But what does a shepherd do? With tolerance. It's okay, man, this little sheep doesn't know anything. Let me go after him. It's all right. I don't want the, sh the wolf to catch him. I don't want the wolf to eat him up. You'll go after the sheep with tolerance, with patience. You'll send them on the right path. Right? To, have, to be a shepherd, you have to have a lot of tolerance and patience. So most prophets, they first were shepherds because this is how they will have to deal with people. You will tell them for their goodness. You will tell them for their well-wishing. But they will disbelieve. They will turn around. But the prophets never wanted revenge. They always were forgiving, right? This is why you look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Always he would look for the welfare of the people. right? Abu Talib, he didn't want to believe during his life. All the way till the last moments, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was at his deathbed. O oh, beloved uncle, say la ilaha illallah. O oh, beloved uncle, testify for the truth. And as the Prophet ﷺ would say this, Abu Jahl would say, don't listen to him, O oh, Abu Talib. The Prophet would say, but believe in Islam. Abu Jahl would say, stay firm on the way of your forefathers. Right? Look at how the Prophet ﷺ left no stone unturned. He sweat for this. He bled for this. He went out of his way. To such an extent in the Qur'an Kareem, it's mentioned about a certain group of people. إِن تَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةً فَلَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ If you were to seek forgiveness for them 70 times, Allah is not going to forgive them. The narrations make mention, the Prophet ﷺ said, If it were to be revealed to me that if I were to ask forgiveness 71 times, then Allah would forgive them. I would supplicate and ask Allah to forgive them 71 times so that they could be forgiven. Right? Forgiveness of the people. This is what the Prophet ﷺ always looked for. One time when the Prophet ﷺ, he sent Ali radiallahu ta'ala an on a certain expedition. It was the battle of Khaybar. So when Ali radiallahu an was dispatched to Khaybar, he made certain comments. Right? That I'm gonna fight for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm gonna battle these people. We're gonna wage war. Look at what the Prophet ﷺ said. Oh Ali radiallahu an. The first thing that you will do, call them to Islam. The first thing that you will do, call them to Islam. And only, right, when they refuse, then you are, it is permitted for you to engage in battle for the circumstances that were at the time. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if one person is guided through you, O oh Ali, this is better for you than the red camel. And the red camel was like the Lamborghini Ferrari of that time. Right? So look, the Prophet ﷺ, he never really looked at revenge and fighting people and extracting tit for tat. You did this, so we're going to do that. No. The Prophet ﷺ, his ultimate goal was the guidance of mankind. Brothers and sisters, this great quality of the Prophet ﷺ, there's no Prophet that's going to come after to revive this. There's no Prophet that will come with a new message. There's no new Prophet to revive the teachings of Rasulullah ﷺ. The Prophet left this Ummah with this responsibility. To teach, to call towards goodness, to protect Islam, to promote virtue, and to prevent people from sins and from ill deeds. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kuntum khayra umma. You're the best of nations. What is the description of this nation? Our nation, that's the best of nations. What puts us better than all the other nations? Ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna anil munkar. You enjoin good, you call people towards good, and you forbid from evil. This is the khayriya, the goodness of the ummah, is because 
We call towards Islam. We call towards goodness. We prohibit from evil. So this is very important, brothers and sisters, calling towards Islam. And this doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to have a da'wah table for this. Right? You don't have to go to San Francisco. You don't have to go to Times Square. Calling towards Allah, calling towards Islam, it's very, very simple. Start with your household. Start with your family. Start by talking to your spouse, your children, your parents, your friends. Just talk about Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Speak about Allah. You know like when there's a well and the well becomes stagnant, the water is just sitting there still, what tends to happen? Debris will come in there. Moss will start growing in there. The water might start to smell, right? But when the water moves around, people are taking buckets out, the water remains fresh. Right? The same thing happens with the room. If you leave a room, close all the windows, what happens? It's going to get stuffy. Right? The moment you open the window, fresh air, fresh breeze is coming in. Ah, you can breathe now. Our iman is like this. Don't leave it stagnant. You have to open the windows for your faith. How do you open the windows? Talking about Allah, talking about Islam, talking about the deen, speaking about the Prophet ﷺ. Every household must be alive with this. You refresh your own faith by speaking about it. Right? The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, sometimes they would come to one another and what would they say? Ta'al nu'minu sa'atan. Come, let's express our faith just for a moment. Let's express our faith. Let's believe for a moment. You know what they would do in that time? Just talk about the deen. Just talk about Allah. Talk about the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? Talk about Allah's greatness. This, these are ways to protect our faith, revive and refresh this deen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So respected listeners, this Habib al-Najjar, he gave his life, Allah granted him Jannah, but still what was his mindset? What was his mindset about the situation? He said, if only my people could see, if only they could see this Jannah that I've been given, they would also believe and they could also come here. He didn't want revenge, he didn't want them to be punished. And we did not send down to his people any army from the heavens after him. Nor were we to send down. It was not more than a single cry and in no time they were extinguished. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these verses, basically what he's saying, we didn't need to send an army of angels down. We didn't need to send, you know, armed huge army to come down for the destruction of these people. For Allah, it's very, very simple. One angel came down and screeched. He gave out a cry, a loud scream. And from that scream, all of the inhabitants of this town, they were completely extinct, completely extinguished. Khamidun, this comes from the word, um, like a, a fire. When you put a fire out, what happens? It was blazing, it was moving, right? The ashes were moving here and here, the flames were going left and right, right? You know how a, a fire, when it's blazing, it looks amazing, right? Some flames are going this way, that way. But when it's extinguished, what happens? Completely silent. There's no energy left. There's no flames. There's no nothing, right? Completely extinguished and silent. That's how this town was left. Completely extinguished. This was... The story in Surah Yasin, brothers and sisters, these three amazing prophets that were sent and the consequences of what happened. And another important thing we learn from this story, brothers and sisters, is that these three prophets, their names are not mentioned. Sometimes for deen to spread, for Islam to spread, for our actions to be accepted, you have to do it secretly. You have to do it where nobody knows about it. You spend with your right hand to such an extent, your left hand does not know what you have spent. This is the barakah, this is the blessing of this deen. You will see blessings when? When sincerity is shown through secrecy. How many people we have seen in the history of Islam that their whole lives, so much good they were involved in. Only after they passed away, people came to know about it. They would ask their spouses, their children that they had left behind, what was your dad like when he was at home? What was your husband like when he was at home? 
MashaAllah, he had four madrasas that he built. He had five orphanages that he was taking care of. He was always praying tahajjud. He was doing this, he was doing that. But while he's living, nobody knows about it. Nobody knows who he is. Nobody knows the projects that he's involved in. Because he wants it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? One of the ulama, he mentions a joke. He says, today, this is how people are. Right? MashaAllah, the brother has done four hajj. He's gone for hajj four times. So when the guests come, what will he say? My son, can you bring the zamzam from the third hajj? From 1999? From that hajj? Bring the gifts from that hajj. Right? Don't bring it from the fourth hajj. Bring it from the third hajj. Yeah, from that packet. Please bring it. You see, he's making this mention just for the sake of what? So the person can know Haji Saab is four-time veteran. This is not a normal Haji Saab. This is, he's got four belts for Hajj. He's not a normal Haji. Right? Now he wants people to understand this is who I am. Right? Now a person who's humble, he doesn't want anyone to know about his good deeds. He hides his good deeds. The, the, the pious Salaf, they used to say, the way that people hide their sins in today's generations, that is how the pious, pious Salaf, they would try and hide their good deeds. They didn't want anyone to know. They were afraid. If people come to know, maybe my good deeds are going to be reduced. Maybe I'm going to lose out on my rewards. Maybe pride is going to enter me. People are going to, you know. So this is very, very important, brothers and sisters. Be secret about what you do. Some people, they want to donate to the masjid. They want to donate for the institution. They want to donate for an orphanage. So they say, you know what? I got $20,000. But Imam Sab. Can you put my name somewhere, you know, on the plaque? Can you put me on the website? I want my name to be there so people know who I am, you know. I'm a contributor. I do good for the masjid. I want people to know. Allahu Akbar. Our ulama, they would say, if anybody wants to donate like that, be it a million dollars. Don't take it from them. Don't take it from them. You know why? Because the barakah is in the five dollar anonymous secret donation that a person is giving from his hard-earned wealth, he fears poverty, he lost his job, he's going through difficulties, but he gives it for the sake of Allah. His left hand doesn't know what his right hand gave. Through that five dollars, Allah put so much barakah that even the thousands that that first person would have given cannot match what that five dollars would give. Don't accept it from that person. This is what they would say. Right? So, secrecy in our deeds. Many authors of books in Islam Many authors had a problem. They would tell their teachers, I wrote this book. I don't want to put my name on it. I want it to be anonymous. I feel something in my heart. If I put my name on it, it feels like I'm being prideful. It feels like I'm putting a title to myself. Right? It feels like I'm adding to my resume. I wrote a book. I have a title. Right? My name is on there. I feel like I shouldn't put my name. Allahu Akbar. The fact that they thought this way, right? And their teachers would then say, no, you have to put your name. Because when readers want to read, if they see something in your book, how are they going to contact you? Right? They need to know who you are. If people want to know which book is authentic, they should know, oh, it's from this person. Yeah, he's an authentic scholar. Let's trust this book because he's written it. So they were forced to put their names. But they had these questions that they didn't want to put their names. Allahu Akbar. You see, every, things that we do, we want to put ourselves out there. These prophets that are mentioned in the Quran Kareem, three of them, their names are not mentioned. But subhanAllah, look, their recitation is going to be till the Day of Judgment. You won't know their names, but their rewards will continue till the Day of Judgment. Right? Allahu Akbar. You know, I remember when I was in Madrasa, there was a person, an African brother. And this brother... MashaAllah, every time I would look at him, I would think to myself, this guy is so nurani. He has so much light in his face. He has a shine on his face. And subhanAllah, this person, beautiful, dark, black African skin. He wasn't light skinned, he was dark skinned, but his face would be shining. And every time I would look at him, I would think to myself, why is this guy shining so much? Allahu Akbar. And subhanAllah, I asked some of my classmates, some topic came up and we were discussing, uh, you know, who's the person who's 
gonna uh, you know lead the dars or something like that the revision session so they mentioned a, a certain person so i said is, is that the the shiny brother the shiny brother is that who you're talking about and believe me, when I said shiny brother, they were nodding like, yeah, it's the shiny brother. Because they could see, they could see the nude as well. They could see him shining. But subhanAllah, I asked about him. There's something special about this man. There's something different about him, which is not found in other people. And subhanAllah, one day I found out what is this man's secret. Early in tahajjud time, one of the students caught him. What was he doing in tahajjud time? Not in the darkness of the night committing sins. In the darkness of the night, he would perform his tahajjud, he would clean the madrasa bathrooms. He would wipe them, he would clean them, and he would say, you are, he's a student of deen himself, but he would say, my classmates, I respect you and I honor you and I love you guys so much for the students of deen, I clean the bathrooms for them and make sure that they're taken care of. Every night he would do this in the darkness. Nobody knows what he's up to. Allahu Akbar. And I kid you not, the blessings and the barakah of that secrecy, you could see it shining on his face. Allahu Akbar. Right? Keep our good deeds secret so that inshallah what happens, they can be presentable and we can get the full rewards. When your secrets become exposed, when your ibadah becomes ex exposed to people, you can feel prideful. You can feel like you're better than people. You can feel like, wow, I'm somebody. Protect your good deeds. Protect its rewards by being secret about it. Right? Like I said, sometimes when we're in conversations with people, we try and put it in somewhere. Right? You want to get it in there somewhere. I gave this much amount for the charity. Right? As a side point. Oh, were you there at the masjid? Yeah, I was there at the masjid. You know, mashallah, this person, that person. You know, I gave... 1,000, and then this, this, you got to put it in there so people can hear. You don't want to do that. Keep those things secret to yourself, right? Some people will try and fit it in somewhere. Oh, you know, my schedule is kind of hard, you know, because every day after I perform Salatul Fajr with takbir ula in the front saf, you know, the, the traffic and this and that, but you got to put that in there, right? First saf, I'm there every morning for Fajr. Don't tell anybody. Keep that between you and Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. And then you will see the rewards will multiply. So many people we see in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's mentioned like some of the amazing mujahideen and fighters in the time of the Prophet alayhi salam. They would cover their faces. And they didn't want people to see and recognize who exactly they are. Because their bravery, their you know, going out in the middle of death, presenting their lives for Allah, they didn't want people to talk that that's a brave man. Nope, I don't want anybody to know who I am. During the battle, my mask will be on. When the battle is over, my mask will be off. Nobody knows when I went in, nobody knows when I came out. This is what you call sincerity and being truly for the sake of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. We ask Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala to grant us sincerity, to make us people that whatever we do, we do it solely for the sake of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. We don't do it for name, we don't do it for fame. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in the hereafter we see the rewards of everything that we have done in this world. We ask Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala to protect our iman. Just like this place, their faith, they were originally Muslims, but slowly their iman deteriorated. We seek Allah's refuge that our communities, our family members, that iman starts to deteriorate. Iman starts to fall away from them. And eventually, there's no name left of Islam. There's no name left of the Quran. There's no name left of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are responsible for preserving it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all tawfiq. Is there a question on the online? Someone uh, was asking about calling towards Allah. She said that she's a revert and her family is Catholic. She wanted to ask for good tips. Uh, to help them be more open to Islam and hopefully when they convert. MashaAllah, we have a question. Sister is asking, as a revert to Islam, she has Catholic family members. What is the best way to interact with them and call them towards Islam and to invite them towards the deen? Number one, the greatest way that Islam is propagated 
is through akhlaq, is through character. So number one, when the family sees that you, that Islam has done something for you, when the family can see that Islam has transformed you into a better person, Islam has transformed your behavior, your character, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you handle pressure, the way you handle anger, the way you handle all of the different situations, that in and of itself is the greatest da'wah. That they see what Islam has practically done for you as an individual in your life. That's the greatest form of da'wah. Above and beyond that, always maintain good ties and look for the opportunities, right? Sometimes uh, as a new Muslim, it may not always be the best time to bring up Islam. There's always, you know, many times when people become Muslim, sometimes the family has a hard time processing it, right? So choosing the right time to speak about it and always within conversations, manifesting and exhibiting your Islam. So this is the greatest way of da'wah. So for example, this not only applies to her situation, but all of our situations at work, at school, Show people that you're Muslim. Show people that you're performing salah. Show people, you know, you're performing your iftar. Show people it's time for salah, I don't miss, I'm gonna perform my prayers. When people see this discipline, people see that you stand for something greater than yourself, it opens their heart towards Islam. I mentioned this before, one of the brothers was working in Tesla. So he said, Salatul Maghrib comes in while I'm at work. So he said, you know, I go in the lot and I perform my Salatul Maghrib. So he said, you know, as I was performing Salatul Maghrib the first time, he said, I said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. He said, I turned behind me and I see there's a group of 10 people and they're just watching me like I'm a museum artifact. They're just looking, whoa, what is this? What is this guy doing? And he's, he says, they came to me and they said, are you praying? He said, yes, I'm praying. They said, that is the most amazing thing that we have seen that in the middle of your work you pray five times a day and you're making time for God and you are prostrating putting your forehead down to the ground that is something amazing that we're witnessing right so he didn't do much he's performing his duty to Allah right but manifesting don't hide that you're a Muslim be proud that you're a Muslim right like Habib Najjar he didn't hide even though people wanted to kill him, he jumped in front. He said, I'm a Muslim, I have believed. Don't harm the messengers. So like this, inshallah, there will be a great chance to spread Islam. And once again, this is our duty, brothers and sisters. We are ambassadors of Islam. We're representatives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, especially, especially, especially living in this country. We have an added duty to be ambassadors and propagators of this deen. Right? If you think about how the Prophet ﷺ cried for people when they left this world without Islam. Think of many of us, our own family members are leaving Islam. Think about us, many of our youth, they're leaving Islam, they're adopting many practices of disbelief. Right? Something that takes and requires a lot of focus and attention and ghayrah. Right? You have to have this zeal because when Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, when the Prophet salam left this world, Abu Bakr Siddiq was appointed as the leader, as the Khalifa. The first thing that happened, a group of people, they stopped giving zakat. And they said, they started changing Islam. They said zakat was only when the Prophet was alive, salam. Now that the Prophet has left this world, there's no more such thing as zakat. So we're not going to give zakat anymore. Abu Bakr Siddiq immediately, he sent a battalion to those people to check them. And his golden words, what he said, wa ana hay. Will deen, will Islam diminish while Abu Bakr is alive? As long as Abu Bakr is alive, he will not allow deen to diminish at all. This is the golden words that we need to have. As long as Musa is alive, in my house, deen is not going to be diminished in the hand of Musa. As long as Ya'qub is alive, the deen will not be diminished in the house of Ya'qub. This is how every Muslim, your mindset needs to be. As long as I am alive, those who are in my household and those who I am surrounded with, 
I will not allow deen to be diminished because I will continue to propagate and teach. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all tawfiq and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.